So I have half an hour today to talk about uh, my work with living soils and the direction that I've been taking for the last 10 years with that in mind. First of all, I just want to recap what? What we're talking about when we're talking about living soils. And obviously this is my comprehension of it, but the first thing is that we are talking about no-till, which is very popular right now. A lot of people in, in the uh, small-scale farming scene are talking about no-till and branding their farm or practices at no-till. Uh, but really what we're trying to do is replace tillage with biological tillage, which I think is, a, is an important difference here. And we're also trying to add the fungi element to the system for all the reasons that Elaine explained this morning. And so that's another thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about living soils. And in the bottom line of all of this is that we're trying to develop systems that are both, uh, you know, very high yielding but sustainable over the long term. And we should also point out with less inputs. That would be ideal because the less inputs are in it, the more, the best economics you get out of those systems. When we are talking about no-till, at the basic stand of it, we're talking about not using a plow. When we're talking about market gardening, vegetable production, we're talking about not using a rotor tiller, spaders, or these you know, big soil turning events. Uh, but we also need to think about following another rule, which is to not disturb the soil, if possible, at all. And that's why in my work and in my presentation in my book, I haven't been talking about no-till system, because we do use some tillage, and instead talking about minimal tillage practices. On towards going towards working with living soils. So I think that no-till is good, but it's definitely not enough. We need to add the living soil component to the system for it to work. Then another important concept to keep in mind when we're, when we're practical and when we're talking about growing veggies for a livelihood is that there's a reason why people till. And we, if we're going to change those patterns, we need to understand why growers would till. And basically, the answer is because they want to create a clean slate to start again. Because then weeds get into the picture, and then you have your crop residues, and you want to turn over. And so it's just so much easier to simply till everything up and then start with that clean slate. It's very convenient that way, and that's one of the reasons why most growers are still tilling their fields right now. So this is a very typical setup of how gardens will get established. Before you're planting, you'll have a cover crop, you'll have your crop residue, you'll have whatever, and then you till up your ground, and boom, you have everything that's kind of ready to go, and it looks good, and it feels good, and you think this is the setup. And obviously, there's some problems with that, okay? And one of them is that there's a direct relationship between tillage and organic matter in your soil, and the more you till your soil, the less organic matter will stay in it. And the best analogy I know to illustrate that is like blowing on a fire. So if you blow on a fire, you get a lot of heat really fast, but that fire won't last long. And so that's what we're doing when we're tilling. We're blowing on the fire, we're getting a lot of excitement in the ground, bringing a lot of air and oxygen. We're getting some fast-acting fertility, but it's going to be depleting the soil over the medium and long term. So, these are concepts that I knew when I started my farm, and we were, we've always been looking for solutions to not use the tiller. My farm is called La Grelinette, which is the broad fork in English, and that's what we've been using when we started the farm. That was kind of emblematic of why we wanted to use this tool. So, when we talk about no-till, and when I hear a lot of my colleagues you know, say we're no-till farms, again, I'd like to point out that there's no-till is fine, but in itself, it doesn't really do anything good if you're not also adding other elements to your system, which Elaine talked about, which is bringing the biology back into the soil. So not destroying it is one thing, 
but bringing it back is another thing. And also learning to not work the soils when you're growing uh, annuals for vegetables is not so easy. Okay, so for people that are not growers in this room and that are that have high spirit about claiming no-till system and all of that, just remember that it's not so easy to do this and get yield and economics. Okay, so that's something to remember. When I started farming, uh, I studied at McGill, not far from here, and I studied uh, ecological management and systems, and we were always talking about ecological services. So I was kind of trained to look at um, systems and understand how the ecology could be doing the work for you, harnessing the power of biology. And that was one of the pictures that I took from my book to illustrate how I see the driving factor between when you're growing vegetables is that it's not the amendments or the fertilizers that you're putting in the ground, it's the life that's in the soil. That's the driving factor, so if you want more fertility, you need to have more life. And that kind of guided all of the things that I've been working in the last 10 plus years. Um, so again, some of the concepts, the challenges for veggie production is that to start with that clean slate makes it easier to use cedars, to transplant easier, uh, weeds are easier to manage when they start from really small. So there's a lot of good reasons why you want to have that clean slate. And the margins are slim. So we, we're not making a lot of cash or you know, making a lot of money growing vegetables for markets, you know, especially on small farms. And so to take on risks of doing things that are really novel and different sometimes can be problematic for people because their margins are already pretty slim. And tilling has some advantage because you, you do get a lot of uh, fertility from tilling really fast. But on the long run, you're exhausting your soil. So today what I want to talk to you about, about is different strategies that we've been, I've been using, we've been using, me and my team at the new farm and me and Modelen at, at my, my own farm. And I see those as different tools in a toolbox. So it's not a complete methodology. I'm working on that, but we're not there yet. But these are different tools that we have that you can use in your gardens or in your market garden for, product, for commercial vegetable production. So these are the strategies there. And I'll go through them in pictures. And the last two are the ones that I'm working on uh, next year and the year after, trying to figure that out and see how this could be done both economically and simply. It's very important that when we replace systems, it, they need to be simpler. So that makes the change easy to adopt. So the first one is the uh, permabed. So a permanent bed system is really the backbone of everything that we do on, on, on my farms. And when I started to farm, I, knew, I didn't know anyone that was using a permanent bed system. It, certainly a lot of people were, but it wasn't really well advertised out there. And I got most of my influence when I went to Cuba and visited Organoponicos there. Uh, all the farmers were working on permanent bed systems without any tractors. And what was really revealing then was that you would see acres and acres of these fields of permanent raised beds. And so, that's the strategy that we adopted. We've been working on permanent beds for 15 years. And uh, you know, my book explains how we do this, but the, the basics of it is that once you adopt the permanent strategy, you don't need to remake those beds every year. So you don't need a tractor. You don't need to be hilling, plowing, shaping soil every year because your beds are permanent. And you're just cultivating the surface of those beds to grow your vegetables, okay? Another strategy was to replace the rotor tiller with another tool, which is a power harrow. And the rotor tiller was the first tool that we use on, on the farm when I started. And to be honest, the rotor tiller is really awesome because when you pass, it goes really deep, it turns everything to that clean slate, and then you can stick your whole hand into the ground, it's all fluffy, and you're like, if this was a root, this is, I'm, I'm happy because I'm, I have lots of space to penetrate and it's all loose and deep. 
and there's no more weeds. So it looks amazing, but what it does is that you take all your soil aggregates and you pulverize them in finer particles. And so your soil is loose at first, but come back a week or two later and then it starts to compact because there's nothing holding it anymore. So this is a very, very short-term solution, but it does the job to create that, that, that seed bed that you want. And so we replaced that tool many years ago with a rotary power harrow, which is the tool that you see here, and it has the teeth of that tool is on a vertical shank, and so instead of, of, of pulverizing and inverting the layers and bringing weed seeds from the bottom up, it just mixes the top inch or top half inch on your bed. So that's an upgrade, a major upgrade, on the rotor tiller. Okay? And that's a tool that you can find easily for 30 inch bed systems or for bigger tractors, however you care to do that. That is a quote that I've seen a lot in the no-till uh, area. I, I took it from one of my friends, Paul Kaiser, at Singing Frog Farm. I think it's pretty cool that growers see that. And it kind of tells them that, okay, there's something to think about here. Another strategy that's been really, really helpful and was using UV treated black tarps into the garden. And again, when I started growing, I, I didn't know anybody that was doing this. I've certainly helped popularize that strategy. And what it is, is that we just apply these silage tarps onto the growing areas, onto the perma beds, and that's how we get rid of what's there. You know, weeds, crop residues, um, or anything that's there, you leave these black tarps for two to three weeks and then you come back later and you have that clean slate, which is what, which is really important again for starting your seedlings, for direct seeding, for all of that. And so, and when you remove those tarps, if there was organic matter there, you really see all the earthworms are there. They're chewing, they're coming up, they're taking it from the ground and they're bringing that back down. And that's not science telling you this, this is me, you know, 10 years of pulling these tarps and seeing the earthworms and seeing all the life that's underneath it. It's acting as a mulch, but it's very convenient, a lot faster than putting straw, and these will last forever. I've had mine for 15 years and they're still doing well. Okay, so that's, that's an important part in our toolbox. So we have, Whatever's there, we cover it with black tar, and then depending on how warm it is or how fast the biology is digesting it, then you can remove it and then start new. Okay? Another tool, which is pretty emblematic of my work, is the broad fork, and which is just a tool that allows you to penetrate the soil, open it, but not invert the layers, not destroy the ecology in your soil, and uh, especially in the first year when you're establishing your perma beds, when the biology is not really there, this tool helps you make sure that you have good structure for your root systems to shoot down. So, well, that's another one. So these are the steps of all of these together. For many, many years on my farm, that's how beds were prepared. So we start with perma beds that are there. I did those in 2004, so that's a long time ago. And then they're tarped. And when we, and you see how we drink a lot of espressos on the farm. <laughs> and so the clean slate system is there. The beds have been, they're formed, then the tarp. Then we come with this tool, which is called a rotary plow. So it's a plow, we're plowing. But you'll see we're not plowing the beds. We're plowing the pathways where we're always walking, there's more compaction, and we're putting that soil and shooting it onto the beds. Because the beds, they tend to, over time, they, they tend to settle down. And we want our beds to be raised because in our climate here in Quebec, we have excess water, so we want to channel the, the, the water away from the growing area, and because if the beds are higher, they're warmer in the spring. 
So once the beds are raised, we'll come in with a broad fork, make sure that it's loose and deep, and then that really you know, makes sure that we won't have any problems with the roots. And you see how easy it is to broad fork? Because these beds have been going for so long, uh, they're very good. Now we don't even broad fork anymore. So the last, the, the, then another step is then we're going to put in our amendments. So compost, compost tea, uh, vermicompost I mean, or till, until recently we've been using a lot of chicken manure and then I spoke with Elaine uh, two nights ago and we had strategy to move off that. But we're putting the amendments onto the beds and then the last step is to use that power harrow to level and firm and mix the, the amendments with the top inch of the soil. So we're using that harrow at about an inch, inch to an inch and a half, and we're doing it at rather slow speed. So the tines are not pulverizing, they're just kind of mixing the soil. And so all these steps have allowed us to prepare seedbeds perfectly conditioned seedbeds without tilling the ground. Okay, so that's the strategy that I've been using for many years and that have been working quite well for us. Okay. <clears throat> Another one, ramule wood chip. Probably a lot of you guys have heard about that. Ramule wood chip was developed here in Quebec. There was about 20 years of study that was done at Université Laval about how to use a limbing material in cropping systems. And so what we do is, you know, real ramen wood chip, what it is, it's the top branches of hardwood trees uh, cut in the spring where all of the life force of the tree is put in this branch, so it's full of enzymes. And then you cut those into small parts and then you put that in your fields and then you're adding a lot of fungi elements but you're also adding all sorts of microbial life to the soil. And that's carbon that will take a lot of time to decompose and be digested. And so you're adding slow releasing fertility, in my, my mind, that way. One of the big problems with ramule wood chip is that because it's carbon that is lignin, it takes a lot of energy for the microorganisms to decompose it. And if you plant directly your crops into that, you might have not enough new, new nitrogen. And, and you, see, you see some of the plants are lacking something because they're not as healthy or as strong as they could be. And that's why we put the ramule wood chips in our aisles. So the permabeds are there, and then the ramule wood chip goes into the aisles, and because the beds are raised, then the aisles are lower and that's where all the water goes, which is perfect because the ramul wood chip, if it's going to be digested, it needs to, it needs to be moist. There needs to be moisture there. And we leave that there for a year, and then when we re-raise our beds, then we're adding all of that organic matter back into the soil, and now we're building this over time. So that's a strategy that we've been using and we put about, we do it every, about every four years. So we do, you know, a couple of field blocks every year because it's a lot of work to do this, it's a lot of manipulating and hauling, and, and on that farm we don't have a tractor. So we do it in a cycle where all of our permabets will get granule wood chip every four years. Okay? So, you see the strategy, that's on the new farm. Establishing new beds, putting the ramule wood chip, and it's amazing because if you come back a year later, people don't even see that there was wood chip there. But that's adding the fungi element to the system, and even if it's not on the surface of the bed, you know that those guys are probably working underneath. They're not. It's not like 30 inch, 18 inch, 30 inch like like we see it. It's all underneath. It's all connected. So that's one trick that we got to work with ramule wood chip without, being, without it being a problem with regards to end efficiency in our crops. Another strategy that we use a lot on the farm is green manure, but we don't use green manure to feed the soil with the biomass 
on top. What we're looking for is the root system. We use a lot of rye in the fall and vetch in Quebec. These can survive winters to grow roots in the, in the fa late fall and in the winter and in the spring because we know that the roots will decompact the soil and they'll provide food for the soil web, which is what, what we want to be doing. So the green manure in our systems are not there to replace organic matter that we're adding with the, with the compost that we use, but really to have cover for the, the beds so that they don't get eroded in the winter and in the spring, but really because of the roots. And when I see pictures of what Elaine was showing us earlier, I'm like, I get excited, like roots. It's awesome. So, and we, we have roots. We have rye here, winter rye, that you know, doesn't winter kill. And vetch now doesn't winter kill because of our cold, because of our hot, uh, our hot winters. So we're on our way. So one of the problems that, that I had when I was working with cover crops earlier on was like, okay, well, everybody here in the organic uh, farms here in Quebec, they, they do cover crops because they see the benefits, but then they plow it under. And then that doesn't work in my mind because we don't want to be plowing, we don't, we don't want to be disturbing the ecology. So the strategy that we've been using to go around that is that when we have our cover crop, we mow it using a flail mower, and the flail mower, inst instead of a lawn mower, has teats that are working this way, so you're, you're chewing everything up and you have a mulch. Really nice mulch, green mulch. And then we're using the rotary plow and then taking the soil from the aisles and shooting onto the bed, covering the cover crop, and then we're tarping it. And when we do that, we come back a week later and there's nothing anymore. And you know, we're talking about cover crops that are really thick all been chewed up, all been digested. It's really beautiful and it's really awesome. So again, we're kind of cheating the no-till system with this plow because otherwise we'd be working the soil, but we're adding more soil onto it. We're leaving the kind of the, the surface intact. We're not disturbing that. And, and then that's how we get to incorporate the cover crops. So that's been an important tool in our toolbox. Another strategy that we've been working on the last two seasons is to replace any tillage at all uh, with uh, compost, okay, mulch compost. So you mow everything down, what's there, crop residues, uh, green manure, whatever, and then you just lay one inch, five centimeters of compost, and then you plant directly into that. And this compost is mulch compost, so it's not the real compost that we want for our soil, but it could be both. But for the time being, this is compost that we buy because it's been turned three or four times, the, the temperatures have been measured, and it's, it comes with a guarantee that there's no weed seeds. Because we, you know, the last thing that we want is to import weed seeds into the garden. And the fact that we're planting on mulch compost guarantees that we, don't, we won't have to cultivate for weeds. That's the whole strategy behind that. So some of the crops that we grow on 30 inch bed system, 75 centimeters, will have 12 rows, super densely seeded crops. There's not even any space to cultivate between those rows for weeds. And so we don't want to have any weeds at all. So tarping was one strategy, but using a mulch compost that doesn't have any weeds and just laying it out and then we're seeding directly onto compost and then we don't even have to cultivate for weeds. So that's something that is interesting because we're not working the soil but we're not cultivating. So we're saving a lot of steps here. Kind of the, the bummer with that is that you need to, we need to buy that compost, which for me is not a bummer at all because I buy my seeds I buy a lot of different things and then I sell, you know, I, I'm working with different people that are geeking out about compost and I'm fine with that. So I don't need to be operating everything in a closed loop. So seeding onto compost and planting into compost is another strategy. So it's the same thing, we're laying down the compost onto the permabed and then we're planting plugs into that layer, so it needs to be a really thick layer, one inch. And then the roots then, they're underneath the compost. 
So they're connected to the soil. They're not, you're not planting into compost. You're planting onto compost. And that's why we call it mulch. It is a mulch. It's a compost mulch. So that's something that we've been working on, trying to find when it's called for, when it's not. But you know, these, these compost that we saw in the other slides, a lot of municipalities now are taking green uh, garbage from houses and they're gonna have to do something with that. And I just see that that could be a smart way to go towards a no-till living soil system. So that's one strategy that we use on the farm and that we like. Obviously, we don't do that with wheelbarrows anymore. We kind of try to speed up the process. We use tractors for that. We need absolutely to keep it moist. So you need to have sprinkler systems that are working all, every time of the year. So that's done. Okay, another strategy, and then I have only five more minutes, so I need to speed it up here, is to cover the ground as much as possible. And we use different things. We use landscape fabric for crops that are like 40, 40, 50 days. But we also use a lot of insect nets. And these, they also cover the ground. And agrobond and row covers, they, they do that. And, and for some, some crops that are 90 or 100, 100 days plus, we often use straw, rye straw, that doesn't have any weed seeds. So for different crops, we use different strategies. And you know, the claim to fame also was using the biointensive system, which in itself creates a canopy. So that's one of the reasons why you want to group everything together, is to have the crop form you know, a canopy that shades out the weed and that protects the soil and that keeps it moist for all the soil life. So these are all positive feedbacks and then, and then you get more yield and then you use your material better. So these are, these are basically what we've been working on, I've been working on in between both of my, my farms uh, the last 10 years. Now, where I want to go is work with compost teas and other inoculum and we've just figured out ways to deal with that really simply, just putting it through our irrigation system and just kind of spraying that and putting, uh, <coughs> putting ways in our nursery when we water the plants every day to put compost tea through that without having to work more. Uh, I, I'd like to perhaps work with grass clipping. Uh, I've seen that on other farms, it gets me excited. And, uh, you know, this, this idea of using perhaps more straw, but a lot of straw that we can work and we work. So these are our first experience with compost tea. Really excited. We had the chance to have Elaine at the farm. And I, can't, I don't have enough time, but I can just tell you, she kind of blew my mind. She said, forget crop rotation, forget insect nets, forget, forget putting chicken manure. Just, just, just do compost tea. It's like... Uh, if it was that simple. But since our farm is a research farm, this is what we'll be doing next year. Okay? So, our, our first term event on that farm, we're all inoculated using compost tea. But now I want to get it done uh, more uh, at, at the high level of each vegetable. So these are some of the ideas that I saw, I see floating around, that I'm interested in. Grass clipping, again, this concept of using a lot of straw, having straw in your aisles and then putting the straw and then removing the straw. I'm just, it just needs to be efficient because if we're replacing one strategy for another, it needs to save us time because time is the limiting constraint on farms. So two more slides. One thing that I feel important for people to always understand is this is a direction. We are wanting to work towards living soils and with them. <coughs> And this is not a dogma, this is not a you know, theory that is in concrete. And we need to understand that growers, if we're going to influence them to take new ways of doing things, they need to feel invited, not kind of forced. And so it's a direction. And when I hear stuff like what I'm hearing today at this conference, I realize that we're only scratching the surface. As growers, there's so much to learn. And you know, we're privileged to do applied ecology on a on a, an everyday basis. So, and the last question that I get uh, a lot of people say is that, okay, this is, all, this is all good, JM, you know, you show that you can do these things, but is it scalable? 
And I want to answer that question two ways by saying, yes, it is. That's what we're doing on that farm. But also, it doesn't need to be scaled to an industrial level. Like, why not replace you know, mass production with production by the masses and have 100,000 more farms out there that are doing local produce, direct selling marketing. And obviously, that's what I believe in. And it's a lot easier to change each individual farms than to change the whole system. So I, I'm not even interested in changing the whole system. If you want to invite me to conferences with big ag, I, I, I don't really want to go. I, I'm interested in, in young farmers that are starting farms and showing them better ways to do stuff and helping them in their economics. And so that's, that's what we've been doing at uh, this farm also, at the family get So.